strategy, hand in hand with CLG, who should have published this strategy a long time ago, to start uprooting the ideas that underpin Islamist extremism. The Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, is understood to have called unions to a meeting ahead of the latest strike by NHS workers over pay. Health workers in England and Northern Ireland are due to walk out on January the 29th. Separately, a planned strike by thousands of civilian police workers in England and Wales has been called off after a new pay offer. The government has welcomed a move by British Gas to cut its household gas bills by 5% from the end of February. The energy company says it will save customers on average £37 a year. Labour says it is too little too late. And Anne Robinson from U-Switch says it doesn't reflect the fall in wholesale energy prices. If they've gone down by, let's say, the modest 20%, which is the lowest figure I've heard, then we should be looking at cuts in double figures. This just isn't enough. It isn't enough and it's very late. A doctor at the Whittington Hospital in North London has gone on trial accused of performing female genital mutilation on a patient. Dunison Dharmasena denies carrying out the procedure on a 24-year-old woman after she gave birth there in 2012. A second man denies encouraging and abetting the offence. Figures suggest a core group of criminals released back onto London's streets is committing thousands of offences. Official data from eight boroughs shows just over 400 criminals freed into the community have carried out about 20,000 offences between between them. Boris Johnson's policing advisor Stephen Greenhouse wants the mayor's office to take over responsibility for running the city's criminal justice system. Insurance firm Aviva expects to cut 1,500 jobs as part of its £5.6 billion merger with rival Friends, uh, Friends Life. The proposed job losses are revealed in a document issued to investors ahead of votes on the deal in May. Shadow Culture Minister Chris Bryant insists the arts are being dominated by those with a privileged background. Harrow-educated singer James Blunt has criticised Mr Bryant, who mentioned him as an example. He's called the politician a prejudiced wazzock. But the Labour MP has told Ian he didn't mean to cause offence. I think he's being a bit precious. I wasn't meaning to take a great big pop at him, but the fundamental point I would suggest is that if taxpayers' money is going to be spent on the arts, then the arts should be there for everyone. And LBC weather. Clear spells tonight for London and the southeast with some freezing fog, lows of minus three Celsius. Very cold and dry for most parts of the UK, but some sleet and snow for Northern Ireland and Western Scotland by the morning. Tomorrow, wintry showers for northern parts, but elsewhere mainly dry with sunny spells and highs of five degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Simon Conway. I'm Natalie Bailey in the LBC Travel Centre. In Kent on the M26, the westbound side is still blocked from junction 2A at the A20 up towards the M25 following a serious accident. That's going to stay closed until 10 o'clock tonight. There are queues back to junction 3 of the M20. And staying in Kent on the M25 clockwise between junction 5 at Seven Oaks and the Clackett Lane services, the two outside lanes are closed after a lorry jackknifed and went through the central reservation this morning. Anti clockwise, just the outside lane is blocked going past but there are queues back to junction 7 at the M23 and the M25 in London is queuing anti-clockwise from junction 15 at the M4 round towards junction 12 at the M3. In Dorset the A31 is still closed between Sturminster Marshall and Wimborne Minster after an accident which brought down some power cables and on the M1 in Bedfordshire one lane's blocked on the northbound exit slip road at junction 13 at Bedford following a car that was on fire. In Manchester on the M60 clockwise roadworks are causing queues from junctions 9 to 13 Trafford Park to Worsley and there are delays of up to an hour possible on Eurostar and Eurotunnel Euro services for passengers after all the problems at the weekend. Freight services at the Eurotunnel are facing a four hour delay though and South Eastern have 40 minute delays on services via Tunbridge. Keeping you moving, your next travel update is in 15 minutes. LBC Travel with GoToMeeting. Don't let wet weather put the brakes on your commute. This is LBC, leading Britain's conversation. Deputy Labour leader Harriet Harman takes your calls with Ian Dale at Drive. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Harriet Harman on LBC. Yes, it's me, Harriet Harman, here on LBC for the first time in 2015. I'll be here taking your calls for the next hour. So if there's anything you'd like to ask me, now's the chance, and I'll do my best to answer your question. You can get in 
contact with me by calling 0345 6060973. You can text your questions to on 84850 or you can tweet me at LBC. And don't forget, you can watch us live on lbc.co.uk. So that's me, Harriet Harman, here with the fantastic Ian Dale to take your calls until 8 o'clock here on LBC. And we're kicking off right away with Yasin in Lewis- Lewisham. Hi, Hello. Yasin. Hi. Hi. What's uh, your point? I've got, uh, okay, I've got a question. It's, it's, uh, it's a very important because uh, um, I'm a Muslim and I heard that uh, a letter being sent to mosques. And uh, I, don't think, I don't think there is need for that letter because, uh, because, because you're the government and, and the, the, whole, the whole mosque, I think, in my point of view, need to be regulated and you need to have uh, someone working for the government who representing the Muslim community who was uh, born here, raised here, he's been studying the religion um, inside out and he's got a clue about what's going on in Britain rather than I have someone representing me who's coming from from, I don't know, uh, um, any part in the world, which is you've got a little bit different views than someone who's been raised and uh, bred in Britain. OK, so this is the letter you're talking about, Yasin, which was the letter from Eric Pickles, the Communities and Local Government Secretary in the Tory Lib Dem Coalition mm. Government, yes. where he wrote uh, to all mosques. Have you actually seen the letter, Yasin? Because I know there's uh, been quite a controversy about it, but actually, if you look at the letter... I think it's actually a very good letter because he's basically saying we, I mean, and I've got no, I, I don't, you know, Eric Pickles is not my best friend at all. In fact, I totally oppose just about everything that he does and says. However, I think this is a good letter because he's basically saying we know that these terrible murders that were carried out in Paris, Paris they are nothing to do with Islam or with Muslims. And so he's reassuring that he knows he knows that. He's saying they want to give the support that mosques need in case there's any uh, response attacks. Anybody experiencing violence should report it. Um, he's also offering help with legal issues if anybody wants to be in the mosque tackling, if they think they've got a problem with extremism and they want to have some advice on how to tackle it. So I think the letter is, is actually quite a good letter. And the point is we need to try and find ways where we all reach agreement on this rather than actually the terrorists want us all to divide and be arguing amongst ourselves and we mustn't play into their hands. What, what do you make of the um, Muslim Council of Britain's response to this? Because I think it's pretty disgraceful. Well, I think it's it's a pity because I think that the letter is well-intentioned and I think it's actually pretty well-drafted. And I know, Ian, you spoke to Sadiq Khan, who is a Labour Member of Parliament and if we win the election, will be in the Cabinet. And... He thinks it's a good letter and that he wants everybody to be recognising that we're all on the same side as this. Uh, you know, so so I think that we, I think that Eric Pickles and uh, the Muslim Council of Britain need to sit down very quickly to talk this through and realise that they're all on the same side. Uh, when you've had, I don't know if you've had meetings with the Muslim Council of Britain, but um, how representative do you think they are of of normal Muslim members of society? Well, I mean, I don't know. What does Yassin think about that? I mean, I'm not, you know, it's not that the Muslim Council of Britain is representing Muslims in this country rather than representing me. Um, and I think that they, um, I don't know, what does Yassin think? Hello. Basically, uh, this is why my, I raised this point. It's not regarding the letter. The letter is a very diplomatic letter to, to talking to someone to work with you. But this is, this is what my point race is basically we need someone to work with the government and and closely and representing me as a muslim i don't want to see someone who's refusing who's refusing dialogue if you know what I want. oh i see so you're criticizing the the deputy chair of the muslim council of britain are you and saying he's not speaking for you when he's criticizing yeah, the government not, yeah because it's not islam really it's not this is what I don't like. I like, I like someone who like, is practicing Islam. It's not really Islam to reject people who want to talk. So this is really annoying for, for the Muslim community. This is my point of view. OK, well, I think that's been a very, very interesting point. Thank you for calling. Can we go to Fred now? Fred, are you there? I am here, yes. Hi. Um, Where are you calling from? Eastie. All oh, right. So, let us have your view. Well, the letter to me um, is a good letter. But there's one thing which bothers me about it, and that's the line, uh, 
what being a British Muslim means is proud of your faith and proud of your country. It's the proud of your country which bothers me because I've, I'm British, I'm not Muslim, um, and a lot of the time I'm appalled by what this country does. Um, I mean, Iraq was the, the big one, but um, I don't actually see that being, being proud of your country is, is a necessary uh, requirement or that uh, you can actually impose it or, or suggest it to somebody. I mean, an imam, imam cannot um, make somebody proud of their country um, if they are if they see your, I, don't, I don't think anybody's trying to make people be proud of their country I, I think all Eric Pickles is doing is trying to highlight the role that mosques and imams can play in sort of encouraging people to be normal members of society. But I think Fred is making quite an interesting point, which is that he's saying, actually, you don't have to be proud of your country to be British. You don't have to be proud of your country. That's part of the paradox Mm. of Britishness. You actually don't have to be flag-waving. So why are we making out the point that actually, if you're Muslim in this country, you have to be flag-waving when for people who are born and brought up with here, they don't have to be told by anybody. They don't need, you know, they, 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 it's not for anybody to tell them whether or not they should be proud of their country. Is that what you're saying, Fred? Absolutely spot on. Well, I think that that's a very interesting point. You know, we kind of, we don't really do the, what the Americans do, all that business Perhaps of the flag. I, I actually quite like the fact that in uh, lots of American gardens, they have flagpoles with the flag flying. I quite like that. I tried to get my partner to agree to do that, but um, that wasn't going anywhere. But I think that Fred's point is a kind of, it's like an independence of mind. It's the disestablishmentarianism. It's just, we don't, we're not told by government in this country what our culture and values are. We decide for ourselves. Sure. Paradoxically, that is a British value. Yeah, but that, the Americans don't do that either. No, nobody orders them to put flagpoles in their garden. But there's something about how when they were a melting pot of people from all around the world at the start of the modern America, that they had to all be indoctrinated in being proud of their flag because that was the thing that brought them together. It's a pretty strong word to use, indoctrinated. Well, you know, I'll I'll immediately withdraw it. mustn't use strong words. Um, (laughs) But they have to be... uh, It is a slightly different... Anyway, I think that's a very interesting point, Fred. Let's um, take a text from Amina in Bradford who says, Harriet, what did you make of the remarks by Nigel Farage who uh, said after the attacks in Paris there was a fifth column operating in Britain? And with that in mind, if you look back in history, what figure would you compare Nigel Farage to? Um... I, I I don't know, but somebody I'd compare him to somebody who is divisive, negative. Um, I think that he's uh, he's just he's got no optimism for the future. He wants Britain to be like it was in the 1950s, with all the bad things about it as well. I mean, I just could not disagree with Nigel Farage more on just about everything. Is that it's the outward facingness of this country that makes it dynamic and a force in the world for the future. I don't think there's any role for narrowness, inward looking, um, and so I don't know. I don't know who, who I'd compare him to, well, but I'm open to suggestions. Well, uh, Amina's comparing him to Oswald Mosley. Well, you know, I'm not great on historical analogies, but I certainly think that he is divisive and uh, we need actually a generosity of spirit that people find what they have in common um, as people living in this country, working together to make things better for everybody and their children. Not actually always... I don't like the blaming of the outsider that Nigel Farage's stock in trade is, is that Every problem that we've got, it's easy. You just point to the immigrants and it's their fault. And I'm tempted to keep pressing you on this to find a historical figure, but then I'm worried you might do a chukra muna and walk out of the studio. Well, no, it's just that I'm not a great student of history. You'll have to get Tristram Hunt on and let him answer for me. Uh, uh, have you ever walked out of an interview like chukra Amuna did this morning on Sky News? Um, no, you must I don't tempted. think I have. But honestly, <laughs> I've done so many interviews I can't actually remember. I don't think I have... Part, but that doesn't mean I can't start now. There's always a first time. Oh be dear. careful. That's, be that's treading a, very carefully. Do, do, do you Ian. think from what you've heard he was right to walk out of that interview? Because it's quite something for someone to do that, isn't it? I didn't see the interview, but I think if what he was saying was he couldn't comment on the Eric Pickles letter because he hadn't actually read mm. it. Well, I think that's fair enough. And I think if Dermot Murnahan was 
casting disparaging remarks on him because he hadn't read the letter about a different government department from the one that he uh, shadows. I think it's fair enough for him to say, I haven't read the letter. Well, we have 45 more minutes with Call Harriet. That's assuming that she decides to stay for <laughs> 45 minutes and I don't provoke her into leaving. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. This is LBC. It's quarter past seven. This is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. Good evening. We're still problems on the M26 tonight. It's shut westbound towards London after a serious accident that happened earlier. It's shut between the A20 and the M25. Now, the clockwise M25 still has two lanes shut after an accident as well between Junction 5 at Seven Oaks and Godston at Junction 6. And the anti clockwise side through there, there's still a lane shut as well for those repairs. So, do expect delays both directions on the M25. M11 is a struggle this evening, very slow, all the way from Loughton at Junction 5 up to Harlow at Junction 7. Uh, that's because of two separate breakdowns. One was on the M11, uh, the other one was just by the Hastingwood roundabout as you head off into Harlow. Delays uh, tonight in Dorset. The A31 at Sturminster Marshall is shut. There's been an accident there at the Roundhouse roundabout. And the M1 northbound is queuing at Junction 13 after a call car, car caught fire earlier on the exit slip northbound. Keeping you moving. Your next travel update is in 15 minutes. LBC Travel. With GoToMeeting. Work smarter with a free 30 day trial. Our best ever winter sale is now on with fantastic deals on selected phones, plans, and accessories. Don't miss out. Visit vodafone.co.uk slash sale or visit us in store today. Vodafone. Power to the savvy. Power to you. Sale ends 2nd of February 2015. Terms apply. Pay monthly plans subject to credit check. 118434, the handy number for handy numbers. Calls cost 76 pence plus £1.53 per minute from a BT landline. Other networks vary and mobiles cost considerably more. The PPI Miss Selling Saga has been going on for years. If you're concerned that you've left it too late to claim your PPI back, think again. Direct redress have claimed back millions of pounds for clients that were victims of the PPI scandal, even if you don't have any agreement numbers or original paperwork. To find out more, text the word PPI to 87121. That's PPI to 87121. Direct redress. Experts in financial claims. Good day, sir. May I help you with your bags? Presidential suite, I assume. Oh, no, no. Ah, I... the king executive. Very good, sir. No, actually, i Deluxe I'm... executive. Still exquisite. No. Which room are you in, then? The conference room. Oh. I'm here for a meeting. Look premium in the Passat GT from £249 per month. Take a test drive at your local retailer. The new Volkswagen Passat. As advanced as you are. High agreement for business users only. Price excludes VAT at 20% with a deposit payable. If you had the heating on, you wouldn't leave the front door open would you and you'd close all the windows too right but if your loft isn't insulated you may as well be leaving your roof open working with the government british gas is rolling out free insulation to millions more homes across britain you don't even need to be a british gas customer or own your own home to see if your home could benefit from free insulation call 0800 141 3222 or visit britishgas.co.uk slash insulation conditions and geographical restrictions apply Leading Britain's conversation, Sheila Fogarty on LBC. The highest compliment a talk show could receive is it was a good listen. You know, we've all been in situations, haven't we, where we're in a car and we're listening to something on the radio and, and you, you know, you stay in the car park for five minutes longer because you really want to find out what happens to the person who's talking or you really want to hear the end of that story. You want to know the outcome. Sheila Fogarty, weekday afternoons from one, only on LBC. Hello, it's Harriet Harman and I'm still here with Ian Dale. I haven't walked out yet, <laughs> so you can call me on 0345 6060 to join in the conversation. Um, already I seem to have agreed with the government minister. I'll have to sort them things out next. Um, uh, you can tweet me as well, 8... 485 oh no that's texting texting 84850 or you can tweet me and don't forget you can watch us live on lbc.co.uk so now we can hear from zoe zoe you you still on the phone can you say what Hi, you're uh, thinking yeah. and where Hi, you're from evening. where you're calling yeah, from I, i'm just calling from scotland in the northeast 
Hi. Say what you're hi, thinking. Hi. What's on your mind? Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you... Um, Barack Obama seemed to give David Cameron quite a strong endorsement during his visit to the US last week. And I just wondered what you thought the impact of that was going to be and whether you thought it was appropriate. Well, I think if he was saying that David Cameron has run the economy in a good way, I think most the impact it will have will is that most people will feel that Obama doesn't really know what is going on in this country and doesn't know that although the reco- the figures might show that there's being an economic recovery, that most people don't feel better off. And therefore, for Obama to say David Cameron's right and everything's fine, well, I think people will just disagree with um, President Obama and they'll just think of their own experience. Um, what, what do you think, Zoe? I don't know. I mean, I understood that employment was going up, which has always got to be a good thing for any economy. And uh, from my end of things, well, my petrol prices have gone down, which has made a huge difference. So I'm pretty happy from that side. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, when you've got Barack Obama and Christine Lagarde from the IMF both saying that Britain is a sort of world leader in the economic recovery. You've got Ed Miliband continuing now to talk about the cost of living crisis. And then, as Zoe points out, petrol prices have come down, saving, I mean, if you do an average 10 to 12,000 miles a year, you're probably going to be 80, 100 pounds better off just through, through that. And you've got gas prices coming down. Is that really going to resonate between now and the election for a lot of people? What, the cost of living issues? Yeah, Yeah, because I think that notwithstanding... Inflation, 0.5%. Yeah, but I think that people know that their pay has stagnated and that uh, costs have gone up, especially energy bills... A, a way, a way ahead of what their pay has gone up and therefore they have lost out actually during the course of this government they've lost out you're, you're absolutely right on that but don't you think that at an election people tend to look at the next five years they don't tend to look back i mean even if a government's done a brilliant job very few people say well thanks for that we're going to vote for you they want to know what you're going to do for them in the next five years and if they think that well we've got two or three percent growth now prices are coming down wages are going up that's quite a difficult and that's why Cameron and Osborne, there's another poll out today showing them way ahead of Ed Balls and Ed Miliband in terms of economic competence. That must be worrying for you. Well, I think, you know, we don't... It it partly depends. These opinion polls about what people's views are very much does depend on how you ask the question and what the question is. But we do know that that the the Tory Lib Dem government did not want to even be discussing the squeeze on living standards. And it was a preoccupation. It is a preoccupation for a lot of people still. And it's Ed Miliband that put it on the agenda. And the truth is the economy was growing when we left office. But actually, it then shrunk when the Tories came in. And therefore, we've had lost economic growth. And I think although Zoe's right to point out the employment figures are getting better, the problem is that too many of them are temporary jobs and people don't have long-term security or people are working more than one part-time job. So I think that, you know, what, what whatever Cameron or Obama says, I think that... Um, that the, the Tories have not run the economy well and people have lost out. Unless, of course, you're at the very top, in which case you've had an absolute but, bonanza. But in, in order to prove economic competence, do you not have to say, well in advance of the election, and bear in mind the election campaign starts on the 31st of March, do you not have to say exactly what taxes you would put up and what spending cuts you're going to make? Now, I saw you with Andrew Neil yesterday on the Sunday Politics and he really pressed you on this and you didn't give him an answer. Oh, I think I did give him an answer. I basically said... Well, it wasn't one he was happy with anyway. (laughs) Well, you know, it's his job to to press. And we, you know, you you don't before an election set out the actual budget that you're going to do as the first budget in government. But you do have to set forth what your priorities are so people get a sense of what your approach is. So, for example, we have said that we would introduce a mansion tax and use Mm. that money to help the health service. We've said we would reverse the cut in the top rate of tax for people earning more than £150,000 and use that money to pay down the deficit that we would abolish the bedroom tax. So we have said a lot about taxes. Well, no, you haven't because that only accounts for about £3 billion worth of revenue. You you said about a banker's bonus. But if you're going to to pay down the deficit by the end of the Parliament, people are going to need a lot more detail than that. And I would suggest that they want it before the election, not after. 
Well, I think people need to know what our approach is and our approach is fairness. I mean, memorably, John Smith, do you remember, did a budget when he was Labour leader. He did the shadow budget mm. before the election and he, he, he laid out every single bit of detail. But actually, what people want to know is what is your approach? And our approach is well, that we are not going to squeeze he, he the got, people who are in the middle. He got a lot of respect for that. And the reason well, why... Well, we lost they, the election, yeah, thank you very much, but that was because Ian. of Neil Kinnock, not John, John Smith. Should we go to... Well, Jay? no, I think it was just too too complicated to try and lay it all out from opposition. I didn't, you know, I don't agree with the shadow budget. Let's go to uh, Jay in Portsmouth, who's got a a comment on this. Hello, Jay. Hi, Jay. Uh, Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm I'm very well. What what are you, depending on what you say next? (laughs) Let's hear your views. Uh, I I, I wanted to pick up, actually, on what the last caller was talking about, about um, you saying that the UK economy isn't actually on the mend, and then you, you went on and spoke about how temporary there are more temporary jobs rather than full-time security i i agree with you in that sense but isn't that harking back to the old government when uh well basically there's a larger pool of talent now available of professionals who were taken out of their jobs and there's more graduates than ever now coming out of university who have to take the temporary work in order to well pass the time really until they can find the security i think that's where most of the temporary work is actually coming from um and I don't really know how you could also say how um, uh, you said um, that people don't feel secure or don't feel that they're, you know, they, they're not feeling that the economy is in a better shape. I don't know, like, I don't know if there was a survey done or where you got that statement from. That's, that's just something I, I don't really understand. So, so you, mind, you... Like, house prices are higher than ever and, you know, uh, the inflation's lower than ever and interest rates are lower than ever. I think that people are definitely feeling it, especially you can see it through the petrol prices as well. I mean, Jay, you, you live in Portsmouth. There are two marginal seats in Portsmouth. Um, how how mm-hmm. will you decide who you're going to vote for, or have you? Um, I have essentially decided, um, and it's it's a, a decision based on, you know, what's what I, what I feel is going to be the best for, you know, for the economy in the long run. And um, I all think right, go on then. Who, who is it then? <laughs> uh, they've, they've done it. They've done a good job on it so far. Um, so you Tory can, or Lib Dem? Which one? It. It's going to be Tory. All right. Okay. Disappointing news for you there, Harry. You're not going to walk out on after that one, are you? Um, um, uh, absolutely not. And I think that. But I think that when you've got a recession and the economy's not growing, then the people who it hits first and hardest are the people who, as Jay said, they're coming out of college or they're coming out of uni and they're trying to get that first foot on the ladder. And there's an awful lot of young people who've been in suspended animation because they haven't been able to get that first job and get on their way. And that has been because we don't think that the government has run the economy properly. I'm hoping we've still got until May the 7th to persuade you, Jay. But in the meantime, we're moving on in hope to Paul, who's calling from Bromley. Paul, what would you like to ask? Oh, ha- Hello, yes. Hello. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask, are the Labour Party to be trusted on the NHS? Um, now, the reason I ask that is that I live in what used to be South London Health Trust. Um, when... Um, Patricia Hewitt was Secretary of State for Health. She signed off a PFI deal. Um, incidentally, once she signed off that PFI deal, she, she moved out to work in, for a private healthcare company. But the private health, the PFI deal made our health trust go broke. And then what happened after that, of course, was we had the um, special administrator come in and um, the special administrator scheme was brought in by the Labour Party. Um, um, Paul, so, I'm, I'm I mean, going to stop you there because we're, we're, we're heading for the news and travel in about a minute's time. And I just want Harriet to answer this question because, I mean, Paul expresses a concern about Labour's management of the NHS. We could also add Mid Staffordshire into this. We could add the fact that it was under Andy Burnham, I think, that Hinchingbrook Hospital uh, went into private hands, or at least the plans were hatched there. Um, Lord Ashcross poll shows that the NHS has now overtaken the economy as the major issue uh, for the electorate at the election. How confident are you that, that there won't be too many people like Paul who are questioning Labour's management of the NHS? 
Well, I think that, that, that basically people, again, will judge from their own experience. They will know that it's harder to get to see their GP. They will know that the queues are growing for accident and emergency. And that what always happens, Paul, just, you know, cast your mind back. It always happens that the Tories run down the NHS and actually Labour builds it back but up. Do, do and you even not, do you if not you... accept that mistakes were made under your government on PFI, Mid-Staffordshire, privatisation, all of that? Well, you know, there's always criticism that can be made of particular ways of but managing things it? and managing the finance. Well, you know, some of the PFI deals might not have been the greatest, but, but before... We got into government in 1997. The waiting lists were absolutely catastrophic. People were dying on waiting lists and the hospital buildings were falling down. We needed to rebuild our NHS physically as well as in terms of but the I can't staff. Imagine and that's why we did some PFI sure, But I can't imagine well. that if you had been Health Secretary under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, I can't imagine you would have signed off PFI. I can't imagine you would have signed off the, the deal to allow a private company to run Hinchingbrook Hospital. Well, the two things are slightly separate one of the things about the pfi was it was a way of getting the access to finance in order to rebuild quickly the crumbling hospital infrastructure and actually the truth is paul by the time we left office it was easier to see your gp the waiting list was shorter patient satisfaction was much better and things were really moving forward and now they're going back again and i think most people paul you know with respect to you won't be thinking about the internalities of the finance although obviously bromley's had a particularly difficult situation and they won't be thinking about pfi they'll be just thinking is the health service better or worse well actually it's worse now okay. and i'll just give you one figure Very one figure is that between in the last four years before we came into government the increase in people going to a and e was sixty thousand. in the four years since the tories have come into government the increase of people going into a and e is six hundred thousand. now they, that is not that is that, not because that, of an that, aging that's, population that's a good spin of statistics but well, it's an amazing statistic well, it, it isn't is it? an amazing statistic but, but it's, you didn't that's actually not to point do with out, the aging population no, it's it to is, do with you can't get to your gp G, no it's partly to do with the, the gp walking. contract that your government brought in in 2004 but that's the very point the gp contract was brought in in 2004 we didn't leave government till 2010 okay. and it was fine then so it can't be just the contract and if the contract is now causing a problem why didn't they change it in 2010 good point well made 30 minutes to go with harriet harman if you'd like to ask her a question 0345 6060 973 is the number to call i'm ian dale at drive lbc news time it's 7 32 Peter Ferris has the news headlines. Harriet Harman has told LBC she supports a letter which was sent to mosques in England telling them to do more to prevent extremism. The Muslim Council of Britain says the letter from the community's secretary suggests Islam is apart from British society. But the deputy Labour leader has told Ian Eric Pickles has got it right. So I think that the letter is well-intentioned and I think it's actually pretty well-drafted and I think that Eric Pickles and uh, the Muslim Council of Britain need to sit down very quickly to talk this through and realise that they're all on the same side. The Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, is understood to have called unions to a meeting ahead of the latest strike by NHS workers over pay. Health workers in England and Northern Ireland are due to walk out on January the 29th. Separately, a planned strike by thousands of civilian police workers in England and Wales has been called off after a new pay offer. A doctor at the Whittington Hospital in North London has gone on trial accused of performing female genital mutilation on a patient. Danison Dar Masena denies carrying out the procedure on a 24-year-old woman after she gave birth there in 2012. A second man denies encouraging and abetting the offence. In the business news, British Gas is to cut its household gas bills by 5% from the end of February. The energy company, one of the so-called Big Six, says it'll save customers on average £37 a year. The UK's financial sector has seen its biggest quarterly upswing in nearly two decades. The Confederation of British Industries index for the three months to the end of December was the highest since 1996, with financial services firms reporting strong income growth and falling costs. A property website says asking prices have risen £4,000 in January. Rightmove says despite the new year being traditionally flat, 
Prices continue to rise, up 1.4% on December. In the city, the FTSE 100 has ended the day up 35 points at 65.85. LBC weather, clear spells tonight for London and the South East with some freezing fog, lows of minus 3 Celsius. Very cold and dry for most parts of the UK, but some sleet and snow for Northern Ireland and Western Scotland by the morning. Tomorrow, wintry showers for northern parts, but elsewhere mainly dry with sunny spells and highs of 5 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Peter Ferris. This is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. Still some big delays on the M26, which remains shut westbound towards London. Uh, it's shut between Junction 2A, the A20 and the M25 after a serious accident. The clockwise M25 still has two lanes closed after an accident from earlier between Junction 5 at Seven Oaks and 6 for Godston. The anti-clockwise side through there, also the outside lane shut while they repair the barriers between Godston and Seven Oaks. Because of that, it's causing some big delays through Seven Oaks on the A25. M11's a bit of a struggle tonight as well. Still very busy with queues northbound away from uh, London up towards Harlow at Junction 7. That was caused by a couple of broken down cars earlier. The M1 northbound still looking slow as you approach Junction 13 for Bedford after a car fire and in Dorset the A31 is shut at Sturminster Marshall. Closed both ways after an accident at the Roundhouse Roundabout. Keeping you moving, your next travel update is in 15 minutes. LBC Travel with GoToMeeting, where there's always a seat for you. At Wix, we refuse to be beaten on price. So, we match our red pencil prices to the lowest everyday prices of our leading competitors. Like our 10-pack 100mm by 1.8m Feather Edge Fence Board. £10.98 each when you buy five. That's the red pencil price covered by our price promise and it's got our name on it. Wix. Price beaten on equivalent product within 10 miles. Excludes sale and promotional prices. T's and C's apply. Visit wix.co.uk. Who are you? What are you doing in my house? Me? I'm the gas man. What, two in the morning? Yeah, I didn't want to be late, so I've come early instead. Oh, OK. Why are you wearing a balaclava? This? It's a new uniform. It's very nice. Are those my silver candlesticks? Oh, no, sir. These are digital gas meter readers. Bzzz. Mm, sounds like they're working. Yeah. Could you help me get this TV in the car? Sure. Toyota, is it? Yeah, it's part of the Yaris range. We're only £9,995. A Toyota Yaris from only £9,995. Do you take me for some sort of idiot? Discover all the things that make a Toyota true value at toyota.co.uk. Conditions apply. Our best ever winter sale is now on with fantastic deals on selected phones, plans and accessories. Don't miss out. Visit vodafone.co.uk slash sale or visit us in store today. Vodafone. Power to the savvy. Power to you. Sale ends 2nd of February 2015. Terms apply. Pay monthly plans subject to credit check. 118434 118434 What are you doing? I'm trying to remember a number. Do you want to borrow my pen? 118434 Now there's only one number to remember. 118434 The handy number for handy numbers. Calls cost 76 pence plus £1.53 per minute from a BT landline. Other networks vary and mobiles cost considerably more. The PPI mis-selling saga has been going on for years. If you're concerned that you've left it too late to claim your PPI back, think again. Direct Redress have claimed back millions of pounds for clients that were victims of the PPI scandal, even if you don't have any agreement numbers or original paperwork. To find out more, text the word PPI to 87121. That's PPI to 87121. Direct Redress. Experts in financial claims. Harriet Harman on LBC. And it's only 25 minutes to go. This is Harriet Harmon here, taking your calls here on LBC with Ian Dale. And you can get in touch with us by calling on 0345 60 60973. And Ian, you've got a question you're I have got a to. question. It's a question you've probably never been asked before. Um, will you appear on page three of The Sun in future? Because I bring you good news. It looks as if, according to The Guardian, they're speculating that sun, The Sun is going to drop page three after 44 years. 
Well, I think, you know, it will be page, it will be the sun moving into the 21st century if that is the case, because actually we do think in a newspaper, which is about news, the idea of girls standing there in their knickers with some sort of pseudo political quote, I mean, it really is not the representation of women's role in this country that I want to see. So I've always been against page three, but, you know, bearing in mind, you know, that we've had a lot of discussion about freedom of speech and what people can report, it's, it's my right to say I don't think it's right I think they should get rid of it but it is absolutely not the role of any government to ban it but if they've seen sense so much the better but let, I'm not holding my breath One nil to feminism? Yeah it would be you know but it's taken quite a long time I think you know inching along with progress it would be, it'd be very welcome uh, The Guardian say they're going to kill off the controversial feature quietly so there'll be no fanfare. Oh no 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 it won't be quiet we'll be <laughs> <laughs> we'll be making sure it's not quiet. Right, let's go to uh, some more calls. Jonathan is in Wigford. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. Hello. I'd like, to ask, I'd like to ask about the child abuse inquiry. If you were asked to give evidence to the inquiry, um, would you be willing to do so? Oh, any inquiry that the um, government sets up and is properly established, yes, I would. I'm not quite sure what evidence I would have to actually give them but you know in principle yes but i i can't see that i would have anything to shed light on it more than anybody else who abhors child abuse and thinks everything should be done to protect children from it well um the one thing that occurs to me is um whether you remember at any time in your career having any dealings with any of the protagonists of the paedophile information exchange well, I never actually met any of the people from the uh, paedophile information exchange, um, so I didn't really have dealings with them, as you say. No, I didn't. So well, I wouldn't really be able to um, shed any light of the inquiry on that. Um, when you were on, on this show in December, in early December, you were asked about the inquiry and whether, uh, whether it ought to be statutory. And at that, on that occasion, you sort of criticised the government's approach. And then, if I recall, and I've had a listen to the recording recently, uh, you, when asked what you, you would do instead, you um, repeated government policy almost verbatim. Um, I was just wondering if uh, what your position now is on whether the inquiry should be made statutory immediately. Well, I think whether it's statutory or not, it needs to be going ahead. Everybody's agreed that there does need to be a wide inquiry. You've got a situation where there was abuse perpetrated by Jimmy Savile when he was at the BBC. They've got their own inquiry. When he was at, um, at various health establishments, they've got their own inquiries. There's been issues of um, sexual assaults in children's homes. They've got their own inquiries. And really, what we need to do is pull it all together, as well as looking at how the police have responded to allegations that people were being raped and they were being groomed um, and the police didn't do the response that they needed and why was that and how can we make sure that they're doing the right response now. So I think really there's so many different things going on and we need to pull it all together and learn the lessons. So I'm just in favour, uh, you know, I'm not doctrinaire about what the mechanisms or the nitty gritty is, but I do want to see that inquiry up and okay. running and I suspect the government do too, but they, you know, they've had a problem with trying to get the right person to chair it and, and engender the comf confidence of victims. OK, Jonathan, thank you for that. Let's go to Teresa, who's in Islington. Hello, Teresa. Hello, Ian. Good evening, Harriet. Hello. What's your question? Given, given that the Green Party is now the third largest party in terms of membership, shouldn't Natalie Bennock take part in the TV debate well, of course, that's been a big bone of contention over the past 10 days or so. What's your view? Um, well, I 
I think that there should be TV debates because actually uh, that was a way that a lot of people did engage with the politics of the election campaign. And if 22 million people watched it as part of the election campaign, the idea that we don't have the TV debates, I think, would be a very bad thing. And I think that it is pathetic of David Cameron to, to sort of lurk behind the idea that he's supposedly supporting the Green Party's access to being able to communicate to the country. Uh, I think really he's just basically saying unless the he, he's hiding behind the greens as well, a way to opt out well, of it that, but for my own true. view but for for my own view on it is that i don't think that politicians and leaders of political parties including you know, myself as deputy leader and ed miliband we are not dictating to the broadcasters no, but you can have an opinion yeah but you know it's quite you, I don't think it's a good idea for everybody to think, hmm, what would be in my interest about how we set up right, the well, debate? And you way. asked me earlier, off air, how do you think we should do it? And I said, well, you decide and you ask and we'll do it. Because actually, really, the responsibility should be taken by the broadcasters and I think that they should put forward the debates that they think would well, engage people. maybe, but of course, if Natalie Bennett isn't included, it'll be a lot of white men in, in grey suits, won't it? Surely just out of sisterhood you should agree that Natalie Bennett would be an adornment to a political debate in so many ways. Well, I'm not interested in women in politics as adornments, no, as so I think as you'll I want to it, immediately take to back that, Chris. <laughs> but I want a government that is going to actually deliver for women, and I'm confident that Labour, if we get into government, we will carry okay, on what we've done before. On, so it's not the, just about a woman right, for the sake just, of it. Otherwise, on, I might want Theresa May debate. as Prime it, Minister, it, which it, I certainly don't. It doesn't look good for Natalie Bennett to be shut out. The Greens, they run a council, they have an MP, uh, they've got more members than the Liberal Democrats and UKIP now. Um, surely there is a cast-iron watertight case for her to be included in one of the debates. Well, I don't know how many debates there's going to be. Or well, assuming there are I'm, three. Honestly, I'm, I'm going to just leave it to the broadcasters and any debate that yeah, Ed Miliband has said... I find this really weird yeah, that you should we duck this to... question and you are ducking it. No, I'm saying it's there are some things where basically you can't both say it, the decision belongs to somebody else, but by the way, this you, is what I think you should do. Well, why not? David Cameron said what he thinks. Why can't you say what you well, think? Well, I know, but he's not really saying that. He's just trying to find a way to wriggle out of it, no, let's be well, honest. You're doing a lot of wriggling at the moment. No, no, because we're prepared to do the debates with, with, the whoever, they put, with whoever they put up. Ed Miliband so has said ITV that. So if ITV on this debate say we want Natalie Bennett involved in it, you're quite happy with that? Ed Miliband has said whoever is on those debates, he is happy to take part in them and he wants the broadcasters okay. to decide because it's not for political parties to tell the broadcasters how they communicate the election campaign. And I think that's not slipperiness. That's an important point of principle. We have another 15 minutes with Harriet Harman. 0345 6060 973. I bring you the sad news, Harriet, that um, a tweet from The Sun says page three will be in The Sun tomorrow in the same place it's always been, between page two and page four. This is LBC at 7.46. This is Adam Moore in the LBC Travel Centre. The M26 still shut westbound towards the M25 after a serious accident from earlier. It's closed from the A20 at Junction 2A towards the M25. The clockwise M25 still two lanes shut as well for emergency repairs between Seven Oaks and Godston. That's Junction 5 to 6. And the anti clockwise side through there is also a lane closed for those repairs between Godston and Seven Oaks. I do expect delays there. That's putting extra pressure on other routes, in particular the A25 through Seven Oaks. Very slow at the moment between Phil lane and uh, the A233 at Westerham. Now we've got problems uh, in Dorset tonight. The A31 has been shut both ways at Sturminster Marshall after a serious accident. It's closed between Pool Road at the Roundhouse Roundabout and the exit for a Winborn Road. And in Worcestershire, the M5 southbound is slow as a van broken down, blocking the inside lane at Junction 6 for Worcester and the A449. So do expect some queues on the approach. Keeping you moving, your next travel update is in half an hour. LBC Travel with GoToMeeting, where there's always a seat for you. At Wix, we refuse to be beaten on price. So, we match our red pencil prices to the lowest everyday prices of our leading competitors. Like our 1800 by 900 by 12.5 mm Knauf plasterboard square edge. £4.19 when you buy five. That's the red pencil price covered by our price promise and it's got our name on it.
Wix. Price beaten on equivalent product within 10 miles. Exclude sale and promotional prices. T's and C's apply. Visit wix.co.uk. 118434. The handy number for handy numbers. Calls cost 76 pence plus £1.53 per minute from a BT landline. Other networks vary and mobiles cost considerably more. If you had the heating on, you wouldn't leave the front door open, would you? And you'd close all the windows too, right? But if your loft isn't insulated, you may as well be leaving your roof open. Working with the government, British Gas is rolling out free insulation to millions more homes across Britain. You don't even need to be a British Gas customer or own your own home. To see if your home could benefit from free insulation, call 0800 141 3222 or visit britishgas.co.uk slash insulation. Conditions and geographical restrictions apply. The PPI mis-selling saga has been going on for years. If you're concerned that you've left it too late to claim your PPI back, think again. Direct Redress have claimed back millions of pounds for clients that were victims of the PPI scandal, even if you don't have any agreement numbers or original paperwork. To find out more, text the word PPI to 87121. That's PPI to 87121. Direct Redress. Experts in financial claims. Good day, sir. May I help you with your bags? Presidential suite, I assume. Oh, no, no. Ah, I... the king executive. Very good, sir. No, actually, Deluxe I'm... Deluxe executive. Still exquisite. No. Which room are you in, then? The conference room. Oh. I'm here for a meeting. Look premium in the Passat GT from £249 per month. Take a test drive at your local retailer. The new Volkswagen Passat. As advanced as you are. Higher agreement for business users only. Price excludes VAT at 20% with a deposit payable. The sign ahead says road works. <laughs> How ironic. It clearly doesn't. If it did, I wouldn't be stuck in jams each day. It should say no road works. If your commute is driving you round the bend, hold online meetings from home using Citrix GoToMeeting. Save time, money and your sanity. Start your free 30-day trial now. Visit gotomeeting.co.uk. Fastlane. Now don't get me started on that. Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. New research today publishes the facts on benefits in the EU. There are 65,000 European immigrants claiming unemployment benefit here, while there are 30,000 Britons claiming the same benefits abroad. With the numbers in the tens of thousands, is the issue of immigrants claiming benefits in the UK a myth or a real problem? Leading Britain's conversation, Clive Bull. This evening from 8 on LBC. So that's Clive Bull with you after eight here on LBC. And we've got just under 10 minutes to go with me, Harriet Harmon, and Ian Dale taking your calls. And we've got Kevin, who's called in from Bristol. Kevin, what do you want to say? Good evening. Um, Good evening. I was very happy today to learn that uh, British Gas would be cutting their energy bills by 5%. And I think, like many people, I hope that they will come down further in the coming months if energy prices stay low. But I seem to recall at your 2013 conference, Harriet, that you passed a motion which said that prices would be frozen, energy prices would be frozen for 20 months, not capped. Do you think that you got that wrong? No, we absolutely were clear that it was about stopping energy prices going up, especially when the... Uh, wholesale price of energy goes down and then the, the, the energy companies were not passing them on to the consumer. We were absolutely clear there was a problem with energy prices going up. So why, and did, so, why did you use the word freeze then? A freeze means that a price stays it, static. No, well look, this is a technicality but we were absolutely clear that we were freezing them to stop them going up and actually the truth is that they have not been bringing them down in line with the fall in energy prices wholesale. There is still a problem. But honestly, if if the election campaign is going to be people kind of alleging that when we said there's a problem with energy prices going up and we said that that, that increase needs to be frozen, that somehow we are on the side of high energy prices. I mean, beam me up, Scotty, basically. But, but, Kevin, surely you know what we meant, which was we don't want prices to go up. And we just did a big ice cube, freezing it to try and make sure that people didn't think that they were still going to be at the mercy of prices going up, especially when wholesale was going all of up. This sort of, um, um, you know, interference in these kind of things just brings back bad memories and of, of, of 
previous Labour administrations and where you've gone wrong in the past. Well, you know what? I think sometimes the state does have to interfere if consumers are being ripped off and the six big energy companies that are taking money and profits and they're not passing on prices falling to consumers at a time when feeling of people are feeling on the cost of living is squeezing on them. And it's really unfair how consumers were being treated. And actually, I think that part of the pressure on the companies and why you're beginning to see at a snail's pace, infinitesimally small cuts in prices, is because the pressure that has been put on them publicly. So I think it's a good thing. If the market fails and is not fair, then actually government does have to set it, step in, and then we would reset the market and sort the market out to make sure it works fairly. Are there areas that you can see that sort of approach past energy prices? Um... Not in particular. Are you thinking of one that I've forgotten that I mean? No, no I, I was just wondering if this sort of approach was, you know, sort of more symptomatic of, of current thinking within your front bench. Of, well, it, of, of it's symptomatic of understanding the problems that people have and saying we're not just going to wring our hands and say that's terribly mean of the energy companies to rip you off we're going to use the power of government to be on the side of people who are being ripped off. Isn't that right to be doing that, Kevin? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, what, uh, you, three times there you said we've been absolutely clear about this when a politician ever says I've been absolutely clear about this it usually means that the electorate think they've been less than clear about it I mean if, if you wanted a cap why didn't you say we'll have a cap rather than a freeze well I think that we must have thought that actually freeze represents it better than a cap do people talk in terms of caps I mean what does a cap yeah, mean to ca- people? But freeze that bill. Fees, that's what you've talked about a lot. You didn't say you'd freeze yeah, them. But, you said you'd cap them. Yeah, but we then had a whole campaign about, behind it, which is freeze that bill, which was an excellent campaign. And I think it did result in pressure on the energy companies to not take enormous bonuses. Well, it's, they did still okay. take loads of bonuses and right. to at least put them down. But have we got another call coming well, in? We have, which we're going to go to in just a second. But first, I want to ask you about a poll out this evening which asked what animal party leaders were most like. Um, I wonder if you would answer the same question. What animal do you think that Nick Clegg most resembles? Um, I think I know the answer to this. Oh, do you? Because I am exceptionally (laughs) well-briefed. He is like, hmm, can I guess a chihuahua in David Cameron's handbag? (laughs) Correct. Okay, let's go through the others. Nigel Farage? Oh, I really like animals. I don't think he's like an animal. Lizard? (laughs) It was a weasel, actually. Is this reducing the tone of this Well, it really is, but um, Ed Miliband, what animal do you think he's like? I Um, I said a panda. I think, I think um, I'm glad I said that we should move on at that point. I don't know. I think that it's ridiculous. Why on earth would anybody ask what people <laughs> think animals they're like? You know, honestly, oh, free, they're free, like free humans. Hit now. Free hit, David Cameron. Come on, you, chameleon. That's what you should answer. That was that was a big Labour Party campaign. Wasn't oh it, when right, he was first elected. Yeah, but that's his behaviour, not what he looks like. Oh, you, you've Changing just, you've disappointed me now, Harriet. With yeah, that that's one, you were behavior. overbriefed, if I may say so. I know. So. Um, I know. Now you've caught me out. You see, I wasn't Peter briefed on David Cameron, so I've got nothing to say. Peter, what would you like to ask? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so, if the next election returns yet another unclear result. What are the issues that the Labour Party will not negotiate on? What are the principles that they cannot change? Red lines, Harriet. OK, well, I think, I mean, I know that it will sound very sort of slippery and evasive yeah, so for me to it. not don't say answer it. this question. Don't, don't but say that I'm not a commentator because you've said that no, before. No, no, but it is like you know, going up to an Olympic athlete as they stretch their feet back into the starting blocks and say, by the way, what are you going to do when you come forth? The point is, we are arguing about what we want to do when we get in and when we, yeah. we're fighting for an overall majority. You, and, you know, and I'm we, not we going to start that. a negotiation we, we ahead that. of the election. But you've seen Peter Kellner's prediction. Um, I've just told you what my prediction was, where both of us, and I think virtually every political pundit and every politician that I talk to, thinks there is likely to be a hung parliament. So you've got to go into that election thinking, well, if there is this outcome, uh, we need to be prepared for it. Uh, I mean, uh, bedroom tax, would that not be a red line? But we've said 
in in our we we've said we're going to put in our manifesto that if we get elected we will abolish the bedroom tax mm. we've actually said but in, but in a coalition um, you can't will... do everything that you want but there are some things that you can say well whatever you say we're not going to yeah but we're not going to produce a manifesto and say here's our manifesto but by the way half of these things we'd be happy to chuck out if some other party doesn't like it i think that we've got to look at what we think the problems are in this country and say what we believe are to do it and i think all this idea of starting negotiations about a hung parliament before we've even had the verdict of the voters um you know i know i seem to be the only person in the country who's not talking about okay i'm not going to get any anywhere on that uh chris bryant or james Blunt, whose side are you on? Um, well, I think James uh, Blunt is absolutely fantastic. We all know you're beautiful, and he's earned loads of money for this country in paid loads of money in taxes, and is fantastic and great. But Chris Bryant is absolutely right that there's such a problem now of fewer and fewer people from you know less well-off backgrounds getting the opportunity to have music lessons art classes dance classes go to drama school and actually that's one of the reasons we want to get into government to make sure everybody has the opportunity of being as great as james blunt i mean your first reaction when you saw the article was it was sort of how many posh boys there are in music i mean there are lots of posh boys in the commons aren't there i'm girls to, to for that matter but we, we're wanting everybody to have the opportunities and we don't want to see the opportunities restricted. Um, and uh, what James Blunt was just objecting to the s- implication that somehow he'd had opportunities others didn't. But, you know, it's just been... A, if it's drawn attention to the fact that there is a problem with a, a, a shrinking opportunities under this government for people to do art, dance, drama, theatre, okay. then that's been a good row. Harriet, thank you very much indeed. That brings us to the end of the hour. We've only got two more of these before the election, can you believe? Uh, I will be back tomorrow at four. Coming next, it's Clive Bull. Ian, thank you very much. And coming up after...